This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. I'm David Blaney. Concrete is the most consumed resource on Earth next to water, but it also has a massive carbon footprint, accounting for 8% of the world's CO2 emissions. Curtin researchers Dr Navdeep Dami and Professor Abhijit Mukherjee from the School of Civil and Mechanical Engineering at Curtin are exploring greener alternatives to concrete. They're developing a self-healing and sustainable bio-cement from natural microbes, that is, living organisms. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Our pleasure. Navdeep, are we soon going to be inhabiting living buildings? Thank you very much for this wonderful question. So if you ask me that will we be inhabiting the buildings in future, I'll say that we have been doing it even in the past without knowledge about it. So if we talk about one of the examples I would like to mention here is the Great Wall of China. So the construction of Great Wall of China included addition of a couple of materials along with the mud and clay, which were molasses, eggs, blood. So without even knowing that what we are doing there, we were actually doing biomineralization. So we have living walls ever since we know construction. So in the future, yes. So now we will have better buildings. We will have living buildings. These living buildings will have living organisms, which we call bacteria. So, yeah. What are biominerals and um, what are the key processes involved in biomineralization? Well, um, if I have to uh, get uh, an example from, say, culinary world, it requires a cook and ingredients. And the cook um, has a wonderful recipe, and that recipe changes from place to place, from different um, environment to environment. The cook there are the bacteria. Um, they cook calcium carbonate, which is a wonderfully durable material and most abandoned in the natural world, um, and therefore it requires calcium, carbon, and oxygen. Um, a wonderful source of uh, carbon and oxygen is carbon dioxide that's already there in the atmosphere. So if you go uh, to say Lake Clifton or um, the Lake Thetis, which are um, uh, uh, near the uh, Indian Ocean, you have calcium in the water, dissolved in water, and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and there are living rocks Calcium carbonate is being deposited by the cook, the bacteria there, and you're getting, in, you know, um, um, a growing rock uh, every year. So th that's what, in, in short, biomineralization is. Uh, can I add something more? Yes, of course. Maybe. So if you ask the definition of biominerals, I would like to explain it as the minerals which are produced by living organisms. So these living organisms, they can vary from bacteria, fungi, metazoa, algae. So the formation of these biominerals is all around us. So they are ubiquitous. So as uh, Abhijit explained, that they can be seen in the formation, in the form of uh, stromatolites, in the formation of beach rocks, in the formation of caves, which we are very fortunate to see ourselves in Western Australia. So, yeah, maybe the process is what you just explained. Right now, you're working on microbial-induced calcite precipitation. Yeah. A bit of a mouthful. Um, could you tell us more about this and um, where are you applying the, uh, the process? Well, um, you're right. Uh, it's quite a mouthful. Uh, so we would possibly uh, use a simpler term, bio-cement. That means cement produced biologically. Um, uh, I would like to give a few examples um, uh, from this country. Um, we have huge quantities of cement used for roadway stabilization. So when we have million kilometers of roadways in Australia, um, and to stabilize those road bases, we use cement. So the usage of cement in stabilizing road bases, and similarly, um, the, the mine backfills is uh, just next to concrete, uh, which is a huge quantity. And there, if we can use the bacterial system, the bacteria are present in soil already. Uh, so you don't really need the cook. The cook is ready there. You just need to give a few ingredients and the cement is produced and we can avoid usage of uh, engineered cement almost entirely. 
And Nav, do you have anything to add? Yes. So you have been asking that uh, uh, MICP, yes, microbial induced calcite precipitation. So I would like to tell more about MICP that there are different kinds of microbes which are involved in the process of cement formation in nature. So these microorganisms can vary from, I just explained, cyanobacteria. There are others which can be ureolitic. There are some sulfate reducers. So these are slightly technical terms I'm using here. But what I can give is uh, some examples here. So like cyanobacteria are the one which utilize, uh, which form calcium carbonate in the presence of light. So there are certain others which have some other sources of their energy. So these can be urea, this can be sulfates, this can be methane. So in nature, there are different kinds of microorganisms which are involved in the formation of calcium carbonate or limestone. So what we are doing in the labs now is that we have shortlisted ureolitic bacteria which can utilize urea as a source of energy and they can give us calcium carbonate. So we uh, utilize MICP via ureolitic bacteria in the labs. So we are forming limestone cement utilizing ureolitic bacteria. What are the uh, the benefits and the uses of bio-cement? What are the, the challenges? How does it differ from the... Uh, the engineered cement. Yes, the engineered bio so the, the engineered the cement that we don't use, that yeah. we use right now. So oh, one you, of the major know. benefits of uh, bio-cement is the sustainability factor it in gives us. So because it's formed at very low t um, energy inputs and at ambient room temperature conditions, so we say that this is a highly sustainable material. Second um, benefit of this biocement is that most of the reagents are soluble in water. Because of this, I mean, it's a very low viscosity solution and it has the ability to get into deeper cracks, fine cracks where the ordinary cements don't work. So another third point we can say is that all the materials are natural, renewable, recyclable, which is not the case in case of chemicals. Um, uh, maybe I'll once again come up with an example. Uh, Australia faces a huge problem of coastal erosion at this point of time due to uh, more frequent uh, occurrence of uh, extreme weather events. Um, Australian beaches are in, uh, are in risk of getting wiped out. Um, one of the ways of solving that problem is to beach renourishment. That means all the eroded sand is put back on the beaches. And this is an expensive um, a proposition is to imagine every two years you're going um, and pumping uh, you know, uh, sand back onto the beach. Um, you can um, cement that sand a little bit more to give more resistance to erosion. We can't use uh, engineered cement there because you change the, the, the chemical composition of water. It will be more alkaline. You can also, you, you are going, going to have problem of uh, changing the, um, the natural uh, flora and fauna of the beach. And therefore, you need to use something which is naturally occurring. And biocement is the one that is naturally occurring. You have enough food uh, for the bacteria in, in the form of, say, seaweeds there. Uh, you have dissolved calcium in the seawater. And therefore, you can just, you know, have that little bit of you know chemistry that you, 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 you would energize the bacteria and finally you would have more durable um, uh, beaches uh, in Australia. I, I believe that's, an, that's a wonderful solution for a really difficult problem all over the world. So one of the benefits of biocement is the sustainability factor. So the ordinary Portland cement that we are using, I mean I'm sure that uh, some of us are really aware of this, that the temperatures uh, involved in the formation of the cement goes up to 1400 Celsius, while in case of bio-cement, the cement is formed at room temperature conditions. So there is a huge difference between the kind of energies involved in both the processes. So this sustainability factor of bio-cement is one of the driving factors for us to introduce that to the world now. Maybe the four key points uh, on sustainability, they're all uh, finally they add to sustainability, is higher durability, of the material because it's like you, you know, in the introduction you said, it's a self-healing material. It's a living material which, which heals itself. Second is uh, it uses very low quantity of carbon or no carbon at all. Um, it's not toxic. And finally, uh, uh, what Nabdeep said in the beginning, that it actually takes us back to the traditional methods of, uh, of building our homes uh, where we used uh, rammed earth or, 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 or mud or in a stone with mud mortars. So we are back there and we would leave 
sustainably and solved a global challenge of housing. So one another benefit of uh, biocement is that uh, very little maintenance is required. So with the most conventional cements or the chemicals that we use for repairs, so every time the shelf life of the chemical is gone, we have to apply it again. But in case of biocement, because the living organisms or the living microbes are already in the building and they're going to be there for around 200 years as per the stats. So with the biocement, so we can save a lot of uh, money on maintenance and repairs. So that's another benefit that we don't have to do the repairs again and again because our substrate is within the building. So it's, it seems um, there, there are a lot of benefits of biocement. Are there any drawbacks, any, any challenges in terms of cost or time or complexity? So yes, if we talk about natural biocementation processes, it takes years, hundreds of years or millions of years in certain cases. But oh. in case of the bioengineered cement that we have created, we have shortlisted the times to just a couple of days. Oh, so that's time is uh, not a factor, I'll say. But uh, cost, yes, at this stage, we are trying to minimize the cost or economize the cost to the level that it is competitive with the conventional Portland cement. Though there are a couple of challenges ahead for us, and one of the challenges is the newness of this technology which is sometimes not easily acceptable to the engineers, civil engineers outside. So because they have been used to Portland cement and the grouts and conventional chemicals for so long that bringing in a new technology which utilizes bacteria, which we are known, like we know bacteria for their bad habits. We know that, okay, if it's bacteria, it's going to cause a disease or it's going to cause some infection. But very little we know about the good side of the bacteria that it can also help us in formation of cements. So, yes, newness of the technology is one of the challenges we are facing at this stage. I, I think it's the, the, uh, uh, the classic problem of, uh, uh, of uh, news that bad news spreads for faster than good news. And therefore, we know more about disease-causing bacteria and very little about, um, uh, um, about the good gut like bacteria. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we know more about antibiotics than probiotics. And the same with engineers. Uh, engineers have um, completely ignored um, the living material that they work with, really. Um, so I remember one of my first papers when we sent it um, uh, to, for review, um, uh, a comment was that I can't believe that the cement that I used uh, so far is full with you know, dirty creatures like bacteria. But of course, we're full of bacteria. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> yeah. So we're all filthy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So 90% of our uh, genes are bacterial genes. So, uh, yes, um, uh, we are as pure or as filthy as the bacteria are. In terms of the research that's being conducted with uh, MICP and other biocements, well, actually, that's the same thing, biocements. Are we seeing the uh, increased longevity for new and pre-existing building materials, uh, lower carbon footprints in the in the research that's being done right now? Uh, I, I would possibly answer that question in a different way. Where do you see the lowest hanging fruit uh, with this technology? Um, now, what we have noticed is that uh, repairing old structures is one area where a living material can make a huge difference. Um, our uh, latest uh, Australian Research Council project is on that, that how to create a self-healing material, but at the field scale, not in the lab scale. Okay. So that's one area where we think there is a lot of uh, immediate gains to make. We are working with a startup company in uh, Western Australia to, uh, to commercialize the biocement as a product that is like a, it's not really a coating, it's more like something that gets absorbed into the substrate, which could be concrete or it could be soil, and seals it. And therefore, um, the pollutants from the atmosphere cannot go in. And therefore, it increases longevity. So you get a huge bang for the buck where you are using very little quantity of the biocement and getting a huge benefit. Uh, similarly, for dust suppression, you know, we are a mining, um, you know, a state, and therefore dust is a huge problem. Um, you can 
cut the dust down tremendously with a very natural product in this case uh, with a bio cement. So you, you just cement the dust particles just a little bit so that they cannot, cannot fly off easily. They're interlocked and they cannot um, you know, move away from each other easily and therefore you suppress dust. So these are uh, some of the uh, areas that along with the, um, uh, with the um, um, coastal erosion problem that we talked about earlier, these are the three areas that we think biocement has a huge scope. Uh, dust is a big problem in Western Australia, especially in mining environments. So in this case, so the conventional uh, process of dust suppression is spraying water six times a day, which is a huge amount of water and there's a lot of ma manpower required in the process. So with biocement, we can minimize to one set of uh, spray and it's good to go for the next five days. So how much we are preserving utilizing natural materials. So that's a big benefit. So another benefit that we have seen just recently, we have got another project with the uh, Mineral Research Institute of Western Australia in collaboration with the mining industries, including BHP. So there we are going to utilize this bio cement for creation of barriers after in situ recovery of metals. So that is also another benefit where conventional reagents or conventional materials have not been able to function to their best. So their bio cement is going to be applied. So. Uh, Abhijit, you mentioned the, uh, the lowest hanging fruit, the problems that we were able to solve more or less, more or less now with, uh, with bio cement. If we're looking in the, I guess, the longer time frame, what are some of the, the higher hanging fruit, the bigger challenges that we can solve, the bigger problems that we can solve with this, uh, well, with um, this research? Um, uh, the, fi of the final aspiration is to completely avoid engineered cement and go back um, to the natural products that we have been using earlier. Um, the world population right now is 7 billion, um, expected to go up to 10 billion. So if we have to build a house for each individual, if everyone has to have a roof overhead, with the present technology, there'll be no head left. And therefore, you need to come up with something that's sustainable. Uh, the present cement technology is definitely not sustainable. And that's uh, the bigger challenge that you have, that can we really make, you know, kind of transform engineering, civil engineering as it is today, into something which recognizes the huge uh, benefit that the little microbes um, uh, who are already around us, always around us, can give. And uh, do you reckon we can pull it off? Yes. Uh, uh, well, as researchers, uh, we always remain optimistic. Well, of course, you know, when we are criticized sometimes, we, we feel really bad, we take a long walk and come back and say, no, it's going to happen. And, and, and once again, you know, start working in the lab. You know. uh, if you go to our lab right now, there are at least 15 students you know, who think that they can pull it off, and I have great faith in them. Yeah, so even this can be seen in the, uh, like the current projects that we have got, the funding that we have got, and we have been able to convince industry, we have been able to convince Australian Research Council. So that's uh, one of the ways where we can see that, yes, we can pull it off because we have already been able to convince the experts in the area. So we definitely see a future in this. So the future is closer than we think it is. It could be that it might not yes. be too long until we've, we've got this on building sites on a larger scale. Well, a few 10 years. Yeah, that, that's, that's my tag. If I have convinced you today, David, about the biocement. So already this technology has been applied on certain historical monument repairs. So there is a good amount of research which is done in Europe, in the US. So their big field trials have already been done. And historical buildings, monuments have already been repaired utilizing this technology. So definitely we would like to expand it further. How do we lower the costs of biocement? So with the current processes or the current technology is utilizing very pure grade chemicals for growing bacteria, the cementation reagents that we are currently using, they are very, very pure forms of the chemicals. So the way forward is to utilize natural low grade cementation reagents as well as the nutrients to grow bacteria. 
So definitely we need to move from very fancy pure grade lab chemicals to something which is available in nature in large amounts. And one of the ways by which it can be done is utilizing industrial byproducts which are a waste lying all around us. So in one of the research uh, uh, study conducted in our own group, so we try to utilize the waste product from lectures uh, from corn industry. So there we try to utilize that as a source of nutrients for bacterial growth and we were successful in that. So another way to minimize the cost is utilizing calcium and urea from natural sources. So in case of urea, there has been another study where the source of, cal uh, sorry, not urea, calcium, I'm sorry. So the calcium has been utilized from seawater. So that is another way to economize this technology by utilizing um, natural sources. So I'd probably look at cost uh, from uh, different angles. One is, of course, cost in terms of dollars. Um, uh, I think there the answer lies once again in the nature. Nature doesn't really pay to you know, make cement that um, uh, you know is happening in coral reefs, in stromatolites, in uh, caves, in you know karst topographies. So, what does the nature do? It actually uh, there's a cycle of mineralization and demineralization of calcium carbonate. So, there are some bacteria that dissolve calcium carbonate into soluble forms, and the other that remineralizes it. So right now, we have actually broken the key of how to mineralize. We haven't seen enough of the other one that how can I dissolve you know, limestone into soluble calcium. If I can do that, limestone is everywhere. It's cheap, you can, you can use it more easily. But there's another cost which is environmental cost and how to bring that down. One of the challenges that we have right now is the technology that is most commonly used also creates ammonia. And ammonia is not um, uh, a gas that we would like to release into the atmosphere. How to use it back, uh, you know, how to use it um, uh, beneficially uh, is another important component. Um, so we can use, you know, one example is one of my students uh, is working on um, uh, a river valley uh, stabilization in India. Um, uh, now, in that, um, when ammonia is produced, it's, it's food for plant. It's the same, you know, plants that grow on the river bank because we want to stabilize, you know, this, this river starts from China uh, and then goes, uh, you know, flows into India flows through India into Bangladesh and becomes the largest delta of the world. Um, so the, it has the largest and the smallest island on a river. On a river. Okay. So, so the, the river banks break all the time. In monsoon, you know, the river changes its course. So what we are trying to do is stabilize the river banks so that you know, the devastation is uh, at least mitigated. Okay. Now, if you use uh, the technology, the cementation technology, it's a long river bank. So the ammonia uh, generation is huge. Now, how do you cut down that ammonia uh, going into the atmosphere? So it's soluble. So use it to grow the plants. So the plants also stabilize the bank. So how to, you know, once again, convert the byproducts of this process into product for something else so that you can really have a circular economy. So once you have a circular economy, you have really, you know, addressed the issue of cost. And this ammonia can be also utilized as a fertilizer for plants. Exactly. So we exactly. would like yeah. to. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I didn't use Brief the word fertilizer. Like that. you know, that's an important yes. And uh, research-wise, what are you both up to? <laughs> what fun-filled research is happening within the walls of this institution? <laughs> so there are, I'll say, three components of this research. So the first component of this research from where we started initially was studying natural formations or studying natural cements. So in that, we started with understanding the formation of beach rocks, the formations of stromatolites, the formation of caves in Western Australia. And fortunately, we had a couple of very interesting sites around us which gave us a chance to collect these uh, materials. So the second part of this research was to isolate the bacteria which we can utilize for different applications in the current civil industry. So the second component was isolating 
bugs for a specific purpose. Like in case of concrete, we look for bugs which can work under high pH, high salt conditions with low oxygen. So there we need to get bugs from certain similar environments. So that's, that's what we have been successfully doing for different applications. So the third part of the work where Abhijit is expert in applying this biocement into different civil materials and he'll tell more about where he sees us in this. Well, um, finally everyone is a philosopher, right? Um, <laughs> so I was just trying to write down you know, the answer to your question and what I came up with is, uh, what's my aim? Unlock the mysteries of nature on how to live peacefully with all creatures. So Gee, you're right, everyone <laughs> is a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have been uh, successful in unlocking maybe a few parts of the puzzle. There are a few keys still missing and yeah. we're searching them all the time. And, and if we can utilize it in the same way, the way nature is doing it, so that will be the ultimate goal for us. Cool. Well, I think that should I think that should wrap everything up. Uh, thank you very much, Navdeep and Abhijit, for uh, for coming in and sharing your expertise on this topic today. And thank you very much for giving us this platform to share our research with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the Future of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. If you have any questions about today's topic, please feel free to get in touch by following the links in the show notes. Bye for now.